Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And we are going to start with um, Lori, and she's asked me to read the second paragraph in Working with Others. It says, life will take on new meaning to watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. And here's Lori. Okay. And it's wonderful. It's nice and small this, this morning. I'm so glad to be here and um, just checking the time. <sighs> my name is Lori and I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date's October 11th, 1996. I got a birthday coming up on Tuesday, so like I haven't even like started my share yet, and I'm already crying. I was crying on the way in. I'm just so full of gratitude. It's crazy. You know, when you come up on a birthday, there's a lot of reflection that goes on. Um, I'm a a member of the Wake Up Call group here in Park City. We meet seven days a week, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m., Saturday and Sunday at 8 a.m. And uh, it's over at the Senior Center. If you're ever in town, come visit us. It's a great group. Um, primary purpose meeting for sure. We follow the traditions and the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so just to qualify myself real quickly, um, I uh, grew up in Connecticut, just outside New York City, about 45 minutes outside in Manhattan. Um, I don't come from an alcoholic family. Um, Mom and Dad didn't drink. Um, my sister didn't drink. She didn't really like it. I mean, every now and then she would try it through high school and college and whatever. But, you know, she was a straight-A student. She's my older sister, straight-A student, homecoming queen, cheerleader, you know, just the whole nine yards, everything I ever wanted to be kind of girl was my big sister, who is really just a, a super, super neat person. And uh, we've always had a really close relationship, even throughout my alcoholism. She just continued to love me no matter what. You know, it was really kind of a neat little deal. Um, I was the tornado that ran through that house for sure. Um, Kind of turned it upside down and, you know, have no idea really where I came from. But I'm in the, you know, of the belief system that, you know, if you shake a family tree, an alcoholic will fall out somewhere. (laughs) So, you know, that's just my story. And um, I found my family to be quite boring. And um, I just, you know, vowed to not be like them. Didn't want anything to do with them. I actually just really didn't even want to be there and really wanted to belong to the family down the street where the mom was divorced, drove a Corvette, and dated football players, and smoked pot with her daughter. I really thought that was definitely the family I needed to belong to. And I hung out there as much as I possibly could. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, my drinking just, uh, just, it just took off from there. I mean, I, you know, when I, I just, I started drinking early in my life. I was, a, I was 12. And um, it just, it did something for me. As I've heard in this conference this, this weekend, I mean, what a beautiful conference it's been. Um, I loved all the speakers. And it just allowed me to be that person that I really wanted to be, that um, easygoing, kind of fun-spirited, um, you know, could live in my own fantasy, whatever my brain wanted to make my life at that moment. Um, and, and prior to drinking, I just was miserable. I don't know why, but it just, I was. I, I had a, a, um, a disposition that was, you know, there was always something wrong, and um, I began lying. I remember getting caught in a lie. Um, something about my, I don't know, some, I don't even remember what the lie was, but I remember getting caught. It was, I was telling somebody, you know, outside my house some fabricated lie, and my mom was standing there in the doorway saying, well, what? 
well, what was that? You know, and I just was like mortified, but I just, that's how I li- I don't know why I was like that. I, I, I believe it's part of the disease of alcoholism, you know, and, uh, and always wanting to be somebody else or something else or somewhere else. Really. I, um, remember laying on my, on my bedroom floor wishing I was my cat. I mean, I don't think that's normal. I really don't, you know. I mean, cats are really cute, but that's, you know. I just really didn't want to be in my own skin. So when I found alcohol, it allowed me to be in my own skin. I think alcohol and drugs saved my life for a long time. Um, I think I probably would have taken my life if I had to feel that way for much longer. It allowed me to breathe. You know, and, um, you know, on down the road, I um, learned in Alcoholics Anonymous that I, I became a geographic. Um, I lived at home till I was 17, and then, boom, I was out of there, and, and I, I just started exploring, and, um, and I moved a lot. I mean, a lot. I was a geographic. Once things started to go wrong, I moved. The grass was greener on the other side. And that's how my life became. And what happened was, was that I never really stayed in one place long enough um, to make any relationships. I, you know, by the end of my drinking and drugging, I didn't even have a, um, a, I, um, an address book. I, d- I didn't know anybody. Um, I, I was a lone warrior out there just doing my deal. And, um, and it was, it was, you know, looking back, it was really scary and really sad. And, um, along the way I got married, I had a child and, um, by the time she was almost two, I got divorced because of course he was the problem. You know, it was just one of those segregated lives. It was just, I was so separate and apart from, I could not attach to anything. And, uh, and even when I got a divorce, I moved. You know, and that was in Colorado. Um, I finally ended up in Colorado after a long series of moving around. And, um, and now, you know, I had an ex-husband and a daughter and, you know, there I was. And I, um, I ended up in a small town called Winter Park, Colorado, and that's where I proceeded to hit my bottom and, um, you know, dragged along the bottom. It wasn't like I was up here and then hit a bottom and walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. I think for years before I got here, I hit a bottom and was dragged. And, um, and so I just wanted to give you that understanding. And then, so I, um, jumping to the 12th step, because that's what I'm supposed to be sharing on. Um, I was 12th stepped into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what happened for me. In that little town of Winter Park, Colorado, um, I, I got a job. I had to get a job. Um, and I got a job, and I was working in this real estate company as a receptionist. And um, there was a guy who was putting in the phone system, and he had a son the same age as my daughter. So, you know, I just thought that might be, you know, and I asked him out on a date. I thought that might be something I wanted to do. And, and so, you know, I said, why don't you and your son meet my daughter and I over at the pool tonight after work? And, you know, he was like, that's a great idea. And he meets me up there. And of course I had my cooler because I don't go anywhere without my cooler. And, um, and so, you know, uh, I get in the hot tub and I'm sitting there with him and I said, do you want a drink? And he said, no, I don't drink. And I'm like, oh, great. Boring. And he proceeded not only to say he didn't drink, he proceeded to tell me his whole story. He had been in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for 13 years. So I guess he thought he had an opportunity I mean, he didn't know me, but I guess I had that look. I don't know, like we all might have before we get into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, where my eyes, you could see it in my eyes. My eyes were dead. My, you couldn't, like, there was no, there was nothing inside, folks. It was empty. And he proceeded to tell me his story, and I sat there and I listened as I drank. <laughs> okay. As I drank and as I felt sorry for him, like, oh, wow, that is really sad, you know? And, um, you know, I proceeded to tell him my story because actually in my early 20s, by this time I'm 30, almost 30, I'm 33 years old. And in my early 20s, I ended up in rehab because I was a drug addict. So I proceeded to tell him my story. 
Now, I had quit my drug seven years prior to that, my drug of choice, as I like to call it. But man, was I drinking a lot. I mean, it was just I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything without my booze. And um, But I had, you know, quit my drug of choice seven years prior. And, um, and so I told him my story, how I ended up in rehab for that. And, you know, da 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 my life's good. And, you know, oh, whatever. And, um, and he just, you know, just gently went on and told me more about his story and, you know, the night ended and that was it. And, you know, I mean, not obviously wanted nothing to do with him because, you know, he just doesn't drink. I mean, that's, that's just, wasn't where I was at at that time. So I went on, but the, to, to fast forward, a year went by, a whole year went by and Winter Park, if you've never been there is really small. It's a very, very small town um, outside of Denver, and I bumped into him all the time. Everywhere I went, there he was, and in restaurants, in grocery stores, in and he would fix the phone system at my office, and he was just always there. And, you know, how are ya? He'd always be saying, how you doing? Oh, great, great. And um, the last night I drank, he I saw him as I was entering into that place where I had no idea I was entering. I mean, I really, when I started drinking that last night, I really wasn't planning on going to AA. That was not my plan at all. And, um, yeah, so I dropped my daughter off at the airport. She was going somewhere with her dad, and I came driving up the up the road, you know, and went back up into Winter Park. And along the way, I stopped at a few bars and I drank. And when I got into Winter Park, you know, I had, um, fast forward during that year or even back up, I, I started doing drugs again because the drink always led me there. But so I started doing that again. But this is Alcoholics Anonymous. So out of respect for Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that, um, but they are a part of my story. Um, so, you know, I got up and he was the last person I saw before I went back to uh, my house, which was right next to my drug dealer's house. And so I drove up. I went to the bar. I had a drink. I saw Michael. He asked me how I was doing. I said, great. I left. I went to my drug dealer's house. I finished off um, at least... The party and, you know, it wasn't even that late. Like it was two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. I mean, it was just like something weird that it was just a weird night. And I ended up going back to my house and, um, closing all the blinds and my car was full of booze because I was leaving the next day to go to a party up at the lake. And, um, I closed all the blinds in my house and I sat in the middle of my bed and I just, for whatever reason, I just saw the movie of my life. And, um, it wasn't getting any better. Um, it was actually getting worse. And, and it was the first time I was able to think and the connector went like this in my brain. And it was like, maybe if I don't drink, then I won't do drugs. And then my life will get better. I mean, I never, ever, 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 ever thought like that. You know, never, ever, ever. I always thought that I could switch drinking for maybe I'll smoke pot or I'll just drink this and I'll just drink that. And maybe I'll just, I won't do it now and I'll do it then. And, we'll, you know, it was always trying to figure it out. And um, that evening, for whatever reason, was different. Looking back, I realized that that was my, um, that was my spiritual awakening. And I, um, I sat in the middle of my bed and I just saw the movie. I mean, it was, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was just not getting any better. And I picked up the phone and I called Michael and I said, I need help. And he said, Oh, great. All excited on the other end of the phone. Oh, great. Do you want to go to a meeting? And I was like, Oh God, don't you have anything more than that for me? You know, like, just give me the magic potion or the magic words or whatever to make my life better. And he's, you know, he's like, well, I have to tell you, I do have a life, so I got to go to work in the morning and I'll come pick you up after work. And, you know, I'll bring you down to Denver and, um, you know, and we'll go to a meeting. And I was like, okay, that's what we'll do. 
And that whole day, it was just really an interesting deal that whole day. It's, um, something happened where I wasn't so desperate. Like all of a sudden I felt like I, I don't know, looking back, but I think I had some hope for the first time in my life that things were going to get different. I have no idea why that day was chosen, but that was the day that was chosen. And, um, I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous the next day. My <coughs> drove me down. We went out for sushi that night. Um, he talked, a li- uh, I don't remember, but I'm sure he talked a little bit about the program. I got up the next day. I got dressed. I put on my favorite T-shirt, and it was about a winery with grape grapes on it, and I loved it, and it was low, and, you know, I'm getting ready to go to the meeting. And he looked at me and said, mm-mm-mm, you're not wearing that T-shirt to the meeting. And he said, we don't wear logoed alcoholic beverages to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, and I remember that clearly. And I was like, okay. And I went back and got on another shirt and I went to the meeting and I never looked back. I never looked back. And, uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, and you know, what Michael did for me was something that, um, you know, I, have not had the opportunity to sit across the table or in a hot tub with somebody drinking and tell them my story. I have not had that opportunity, but I um, believe that the solution of Alcoholics Anonymous resides in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, having had a spiritual awakening is the result of these steps that we take 1 through 11, or 1 through 12, but 12 is an ongoing, lifelong process as far as I'm concerned, right? I mean, that's what we do. We have this spiritual awakening, and then we carry the message, and we try to live somewhat of a principled life. And um, and that's what I do today. I have a life that ha- I, I live by certain principles in my life today that I never lived by when I was drinking and drugging. I mean, never, ever. Anybody that I ever dated or my other husband could never look at my phone. Could never. I mean, and, and you know, that's just how it was, you know. I mean, I had a secret life. I didn't live a principled life. I don't know why I felt that I was, like, above the rules. I mean, I kind of know right from wrong. I mean, I really do. I mean, I was raised in a pretty decent family. But so, you know, it's it's interesting to live in Alcoholics Anonymous. I grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous. They taught me how to dress right out of the chute, you know. They taught me, you know, how to get up and show up for work. They taught me how to, you know, just put one foot in front of the other. They taught me how to find a higher power. They taught me, you know, how to work with others. They taught me how to be of service. And if I take a service commitment, that I show up for that service commitment. You know, that I get there early and I leave late. I mean, I don't know why I took this stuff so seriously, you guys, but I really got here and realized that Alcoholics Anonymous, that there was a solution here, that this, like, that this was going to change my life, that I didn't have to live that life anymore. It wasn't just going to give me a life that I, you know, oh, kind of boring and glum, but I'm not going to drink anymore. No, it gave me a life beyond anything I could have ever even imagined. And, um, yeah, so service. Um, in my home group, um, we have service commitments. And, you know, it's a great group. And so, oh, my gosh, I don't even have a, a, my glasses on. Am I okay on time? Yeah. Okay. Two minutes? Five minutes? You have about... Five. Okay, good. Great. So I can talk about that. Phew, because I get caught up in, like, what it was like and what happened, you know. But there's a lot, like, of, you know, what it's like now. You know, oh, there's yeah, a you lot. Have five minutes. I have two? Yeah. Two. Okay, I'll wrap it up. Right. Two. You have one now. I have one. <laughs> I just don't want to. I, I, no, I, could, you're okay. I could just go on. <laughs> Once I get going, I'm so nervous when I get up here, but then I can just go on. Anyways, it does. Alcoholics Anonymous changed my life. I have a host of, I have a lot of friends today. I have a lot of beautiful women in my life today that save my life on a daily basis. I just love them so much. I never had women in my life. Oh, my God. 
That would that's ridiculous to even think. Like why would I want to hang with a woman? Men are so much more fun, right? I have a fabulous guy in my life today that I've been married to for nine years that loves me to pieces. I mean, God, he's got to love me to pieces. He's walked this journey with me, and it has been hell at times, folks. I want to tell you I'm so grateful for step 10, but I'm not speaking about step 10. I'm speaking about the 12th step, you know, and that I devote my life to really the 12th step, and it's it's fun. You know, we give for for fun and for free. And um, somebody taught me how to do the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's what I do with other women. I sponsor a lot of women. I'm of service in my home group. I love the home group. I love that's my favorite part of Alcoholics Anonymous is the home group. It's the heartbeat of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you don't have one, get one. And if you have one and you don't love it, find another one, you know, but become a part of it. You know, there's lots of service commitments to do in a home group because that door needs to be open and that coffee needs to be made and those chairs need to be set up and, and somebody needs to chair it and, and there's got to be a little committee and, you know, I mean, it's just the treasurer and we've got a person who does um, public information. We've got two people who take flyers out to doctors and, and the schools in Park City. We've got a gal who takes meetings into the into the jail every Tuesday night. You know, um, it's just a, um, and everything, all of our topics are based on, on AA approved literature and, um, we carry a message. Um, there's a difference there. I was listening to a speaker. There's a difference between a group and a, and a meeting, you know, a meeting is, is just, um, where people gather and just chit chat about how their day's going, you know, and that just really doesn't go really deep. You know, but the group, the home group, man, and if you're practicing those principles, I mean, we just really dig into it and and have some fun and leave that meeting every day on just a real a spiritual high. It's a spiritual journey. You know, jump on board and, and take the ride and, and be of service. It really, it'll change your life. You'll become a different person. So thanks for listening to me, share. Yeah. Team. All right. So Aaron was, um, I, la- I asked him last night if he would fill in and, um, he said, I'm step 12. Oh yeah. So, so I'm glad he was so like excited about doing it. Um, so you want in spite of the great yeah. increase. Okay. So this is what Aaron wants me to read. In spite of the great increase in the size and the span of this fellowship at its core, it remains simple and personal. Each day somewhere in the world, recovery begins when one alcoholic talks with another alcoholic, sharing experience, strength, and... Thanks, Kristen. My name's Aaron. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Aaron. And uh, I suppose... I'm not a real spiritual guy, I guess. Um, I always like some some of the other speakers because they seem to talk a lot about God and or they have really, really low bottoms and they have gut-wrenching stories, which make for good, good listening. But that's not me. But um, thanks for everybody for coming to the conference. And thanks to my home group and my sponsors and everybody that sort of supported me along the way. Um, and um, again, this is, I'm just going to share my experience, strength and hope and um, and. and Keeping with AA's traditions, I might speak a little bit about religion as I go down this sponsorship type of 12-step stuff. And if I do, that's just my opinion. I'll speak for Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a big fear, and that was that I was going to have to quit drinking for the rest of my life. Um, and that was pretty hard to realize that, man, I'm going to have to quit doing this for the rest of my life. And um, the... Uh, the next thing that that uh, happened is, you know, I, I'd been going to these meetings in Chicago, and they, they suggested that I get a sponsor, and I wanted to pick a, a good sponsor, so I took a, a long time. There was a couple of guys there that I was looking at. Um, there was this guy named Ricky who was a U.S. Marshal, and he had a... I remember there was some controversy because people said he carried his uh, weapon into the meeting and there was some controversy. I thought that was a pretty tough thing to do, so I was thinking about asking Ricky to be my sponsor. <laughs> and then, uh, and I'm not even a really good alcoholic. I'm not. I'm not I can't drink. Maybe everybody probably here can probably drink me under the table, so I'm not even really a good alcoholic. Um, so, what, you know, whatever. 
And uh, there was another guy that I met, and he told me that he used to take uh, breaks, lunch breaks at work, and he'd down a pint, and then he'd throw up blood. And I thought that was pretty hardcore. Uh, and I was 26. I'm like, that's tough. That sounds like a really good story. And I thought about asking him to be my sponsor. And his name was Bill. And finally, Bill said, you know what, um, I'm going to be your sponsor. And uh, he wanted me to start doing some weird stuff like call him every day, uh, which I didn't want to do because I didn't really want to know what I don't I didn't want everybody in my business I hated going to AA as it was and then um, he wanted me to uh, be honest with him and I didn't want to do that in particular either and then he wanted me to start going to tons of meetings and I didn't want to do that either and uh, it was kind of interesting they said in AA to stay out of a relationship for the the first year of sobriety so I found a, a real way to take care of that I quit going to AA and, and I got into a relationship, um, and then it was interesting, through through some course of events, I heard some information that most people that, st- and this was outside of AA, that most people that stay sober uh, go to meetings, and um, I, could, I couldn't deny that, so I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, Bill had a sponsor named Joe, who I knew was a real tough guy. Uh, the story with Joe was that he had used to run in a motorcycle gang, and he had long dark hair and a ponytail and that he used to actually go to bars where you checked your weapons like really i used to tell people i went to those bars but i never did and um so i thought he was a pretty and he, i guess he had been shot at and and while he was driving away from something in a pickup truck and, and parts of the bullet got stuck in the back of his head and i thought that was pretty cool and i like joe so i wanted him to be my sponsor and he was bill's sponsor so i asked him to be my sponsor he said he would and i said well will you tell bill that um you're my sponsor now, and I don't want Bill to be. And he said, you know, that was the first things I started learning in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, no, you need to go tell Bill. So I went and told Bill. And uh, looking back, I don't know if Joe was uh, a big book guy or not, but he um, he really helped me out because one of the things I remember is um, – Saturdays were supposed to be relaxed days, and, and Joe would pick me up and say, we're going to go do some running around. We're going to hit a meeting. And I, I was really scared of him. And so we would drive around Chicago for hours on end, and we'd run all sorts of errands. And I was scared to tell him I wanted to go home. I really was. So I'd just sit you know, hostage and I'd just listen to him. And he'd t- tell me little bits and pieces of how to be a man and, and how, to, how to show up for life. And that was pretty neat. <clears throat> and um, I moved out to the suburbs of Chicago, and... Uh, that relationship I had gotten back into, uh, I was engaged to that woman, and I decided that I was too immature to be married, so I, I broke that engagement off, and I was going to band practice, uh, and as I was crossing the street, I almost got hit by a car, because I was because I was really worried about whether I should, you know, just bite the bullet, get married, whether I should tell this woman I'm not going to get married to her, break it off, or whether I should kill myself or get drunk, and I was really worried about all of that stuff. And um, I realized, and at this time, too, I kind of quit going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I realized I'd better get back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I realized I was so crazy that I'd better get a sponsor that I could see face-to-face a little more frequently uh, than I could Joe, who was in Chicago. So I got another sponsor, and incidentally, his name was Joe. He wasn't tough. He later told me he was kind of an interesting guy that... uh, he used to be a real estate agent, and he'd match his suits to the interior of his Cadillac. He was real image conscious, and uh, I really, I really liked that. And uh, Joe, Joe was kind of weird because at this point, I'm okay with not drinking the rest of my life. Uh, I am a little scared about having to go to meetings for the rest of my life. Um, I don't like that idea. And I I settled into the idea that I'm going to go to meetings for the rest of my life, and that was okay with me around this time. And uh, Joe wanted me to do some some really difficult things, and this is is something I heard, I think, back there around this time, is that um, hanging out in a room with a lot of people that are alcoholics isn't necessarily going to keep me sober. And I didn't understand that. And then I heard it pointed out that when I was in a bar, I hung out in a room with a lot of alcoholics, and that really didn't keep me sober either. And I, and I shared a lot of my experience, strength, and hope in bars, too, or misery, if you will. And so Joe asked me to do something, and, 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 and here's kind of the uh, 
the crux of the problem is at that time I used to wear a tie to my job and I'd have to tuck in my shirt and I don't like tucking in my shirt and I had to wear uh, shoes that weren't skate shoes and I didn't like that either. So as soon as I'd get home at about five or six, I'd take all my tie off, I'd untuck my shirt and I'd get relaxed. And then I think it's kind of weird that most meetings are between seven and eight. So I'd start to get crazy and then I'd get really frustrated because I'd have to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think that's sometimes what they talk about when the rubber hits the road because I never had any great spiritual experiences. I just I just went to the meeting and I really wasn't that happy. I was usually resentful about going to the meeting. And then Joe would ask me to do really obscene things like go to his house after the meeting. And we'd go to his house, and, and at the time I was in my young 20s, and I thought Joe was kind of lame. He liked to tuck in his shirt voluntarily. He uh, he liked to wear shirts with collars, and he had a little pocket protector that he wore all the time, and he had a couple pens stuck in there. Um, I hope I don't offend anybody, but I thought he was lame. He had these <laughs> shoes. They weren't quite tennis shoes. They weren't quite dress shoes. They had Velcro on them, and they were, like, usually an off-white. <laughs> And he, I'd go over to his house, and it was funny, I was just thinking about this, I used to write uh, in a journal at this time, because I was a journaling guy, and my, I would go insane in my apartment by myself, and write all this kind of morbid things in there, and when I'd go over to Joe's house, it was really peaceful there at his house, I could just feel it as soon as I walked in, his wife was there, his wife's name was Joyce, they'd usually offer me something to eat, or give me something to drink, um... I'd accept, but they kind of, I thought they um, ate old people food and had old people. He liked spice gumdrops and peanuts, which really wasn't my thing. Krishan knows that he used to buy these things from Walmart with aspartame in them, and I'd drink them just to be polite. And he had kind of lame uh, decorations. You know, he didn't have any rock band posters or anything like that. But but he was at peace, and, he, and what happened is... Uh, he sat down and he opened the book and we went through the book and we and I think somebody had talked about it. We went through with the Charlie and Joe tapes and he he was real big into the into the big book and uh Krishan remembers this. We used to go over to this guy's Tom's house and sometimes to Joe's house and there was a group of us that would crack open the big book and we'd read a paragraph. Sometimes if we were lucky we'd get through a paragraph and we had highlighters and pens and coffee going and we'd sometimes talk about a sentence for an hour or two be, and, and we just wouldn't get that far through the book, but we were actually you know doing the deal when we went through the book and um i heard it said too that if i if i do the steps of alcoholics anonymous i will have a spiritual experience despite myself i can't avoid not having a spiritual experience and that that's sort of been my experience with it and um, at this time i think it's kind of interesting in the seventh step prayer it says i now offer you the good you know the good and the bad and and some of my character defects have been pretty useful to me in alcoholics anonymous because i'm pretty egocentric and at this point i decided um that i wanted to sponsor people and i didn't want to sponsor anybody that had a house really i wanted to get a guy that was homeless uh, in like two three years he was going to be a ceo married with a bouncing baby boy and everybody was going to come and say Aaron is the best sponsor. Aaron is the, like the most awesome guy. So I really want, I really wanted people to sponsor. And, and I guess I was pretty whacked because I remember I said, Joe, nobody wants me to be their sponsor. He said, there's probably a reason for that. <laughs> and uh, I did get a, a lot of guys coming over to the house because we started, uh, I started chairing this meeting where these guys from a halfway house would come. And um, it was a good experience. You know, I, I, I learned a lot of, uh, of going through that. Um, and it was interesting because some of them would start to ask me for letters so they could get privileges to see their girlfriends or to get off campus. And I realized what their true motives were. Um, and, and it was also a, a humbling experience in that I realized, um, this isn't really about me. It's about the other guy. And nobody asked me to sponsor them for quite a while. And then this, this guy I knew, he started hanging around me for a little bit and, uh, I was out, and this is when I lived in South Central Utah, and um, I knew it was coming, and um, I guess maybe this is why I was ready to be a sponsor, because I was like, I hope he doesn't ask me. I really hope he doesn't ask me, and uh, he said, will you be my sponsor? I said, yeah, okay, and around this time, um, around this time, I was moving, and it's sort of the same thing. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe some people are better members of Alcoholics Anonymous than I am, but I don't. 
I don't particularly want to give up my time to help up the new guy. I just really don't. I got a lot of stuff going on. And, um, but there's a, there's a miracle that happens. I've been trained that after I sit down and talk to the guy and we talk about the book, it's, it's, it's a feeling and, and it's a growth process that I, all the little things that I want to do don't compare to that. And, uh, it's been fun. And, <laughs> sponsoring new guys that I remember the new guy at my house uh, is it, kind of interesting because I remember my sponsor would give me suggestions and I wouldn't follow them and one time uh, this new this new kid he was at my house this is also interesting that I, I got the luxury of living with this guy for a while while he was getting sober and he said I'm going to tie a rubber band up to the faucet on the sink so when Krijan my girlfriend comes home and she turns it on it's going to spray on her and I said Tom Oh, sorry. I was like, guy, I don't, I don't think this is a very good idea. Um, he's like, no, 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 it's going to be funny. And, uh, he learned, he learned, Krijan came home, turned it on and she let him know, uh, a little bit of peace of her mind. And <laughs> Tom never, Tom never pulled any more pranks in, in our house. And, um, it, it was interesting though, to have him live, um, with us is that every time we'd go out and do stuff, he was with me. And um, some people say that these are maintenance steps. I think Charlie and Joe in theirs, they say these are growth steps. And the kind of the neat thing is when I have a, a new sponsee riding with me in my truck or with me at the meeting, my, I have to, I feel like compelled. I think it's maybe that shame or that whatever some of those, those things are. Um, and I think they work in my favor. Some of those character defects is I feel like I have to work my program a little bit better. I have to show the new guy something, you know, I have to be there. And, and that makes it difficult too. Cause, oh, sorry, Krishan, but you know, when I'm out with a new guy and an attractive woman walks by, I can't, I can't be doing that. I have to practice these principles in all my affairs at the grocery store everywhere. And it's something that's pretty nice to have a guy walking right next to me do that. And, um, it's interesting. Uh, some of the guys I met didn't have uh, driver's license. They didn't have a car. They didn't have those things. They d didn't have a great relationship with their parents. And I didn't get to be a, um, a part of that with some of these guys where they've, where they've gone home and they've showed up for their families for the holidays. But I, I think that's okay. Um, some people were talking about thankless jobs. S sometimes that's what it's about. You know, I wasn't there to see how their parents reacted or how their families reacting to the changes in their life. And, and, and that's okay with me. I mean, that's, I think the, the, some of the anonymity principle that comes along, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, the other thing that I've sort of learned in, in being, um, sponsored in this whole 12 step thing is I, I've always hung out. My sponsors have usually been somewhat disliked in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, a lot of times people don't like my sponsors. People would talk about Joe, and some people would talk about uh, the guy I'm with right now. And um, that, that's okay, because I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous long enough to realize that they're just like when I was new. I criticized the people that were happy, joyous, and free because I was, I was so angry that I couldn't get a piece of that. And I feel, I feel a lot of times the people that criticize my sponsors, it, it's a scary deal here. It is. It's a, it's a, it's simple, but not easy. It's a lot of work. And, um, my sponsors and the people I hang around with are, are winners and, uh, we do the work and we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, take shortcuts or make bones about it. We just do what we got to do. And, um, there's another guy in the room that, that I respect a lot. And, um, here's the other interesting that I've, thing that I've learned from my, from my new sponsor that I have right now, he says, you only need to look good to one person, and that's me. And, and I only listen to one person in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's my sponsor. And, and I do trust him. I do trust him. And, um, and that's the deal. There's some great people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I like what somebody said up here about cussing. You know, I, I was like, yeah, let's, let's do some cussing. But that guy's not, that guy's not my sponsor. And so, you know, I, I, I listen to my sponsor, um, and that's what works for me. And it keeps my and, – and if you're new, I strongly suggest – it's been my experience because I'm I going to write the, the book on how to do Alcoholics Anonymous wrong – is to get a sponsor and really go over to their house and um, 
appraise their furniture, <laughs> take their inventory, get to know them. But once you get to know them, I, I think if, if you still respect and trust that person, you're, you're, you're going to listen to them. At least that's been my experience. And, um, and once I listen to them, I'm willing to do what they tell me. And I, and I can listen to that one person because there's, there are a lot of little bit different ways to do Alcoholics Anonymous. But um, I, I don't really want to get confused and try to go in too many different directions. I try to just listen, listen to one guy. And um, I, know I, I know I have a, a pretty good relationship with my sponsor because I know where he wants to meet with me in his house. Um, I know that he's got two computer screens. I don't know why, but he has two computer screens in that, in that room. Um, he sits in this chair, and right behind him there's a black filing cabinet, and he has some pictures up there that aren't taped evenly as I would like, but they're taped up there and above it. He has a bulletin board and he has some pictures of some members and some people that he's met at conferences in Alcoholics Anonymous because he's been around here for a while. The wall is painted orange and right above there is, uh, all the things that all his, uh, little ribbons from when he's completed marathons. And, and, and if I, I can tell you that because I think I'm pretty current with my sponsor, I think those Ribbons were taken down for a while. I do believe they're back up now. Um, but if I couldn't tell you that about my sponsor and where I meet with him, I don't know if I could consider myself to have a sponsor. Um, the other thing is I know his phone number. It's 801-554-1911. I've memorized it. I don't know because one of the things that I've learned about Alcoholics Anonymous is when life throws me a curveball, um, I could lose my cell phone and be in a real bad jam. And if I don't have that number memorized, I'm in, I'm in trouble. I really can't rely, you know, I got to take some responsibility here. And my life has gotten a lot better. Thanks for uh, letting me share. Thanks. The wall is red, Karen. Red? He changed it? No. no I've never heard that. I've got Mark for you to read. Oh, okay. So um, Kevin is going to be filling in for Al Anon. Speaker again. He's helping us out. Twice. Which one do you want? Either way. <laughs> Your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others, so never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives, and God will keep you unharmed. And that's from page 102. Here. Good morning. My name's Kevin, and I'm a grateful member of the al Family Groups. Hey, Kevin. <clears throat> I'm really excited to be here. I keep hoping that I'm going to get to stand, sit out in the audience and hear one of these, um, you know. Um, but I have, I've been asked to do other things, and you know, part of my recovery is is that I go where, where we talked about to those sorted areas. That uh, part of my recovery is is that I have to learn how to carry the message. How do I carry the message? You know, I, I suit up and I show up. I'm asked to be a service. I show up. I didn't. Have, I didn't always like that. Um, I would much rather hang out in front of the TV, watch whatever. Sometimes not watch anything. Just hang out. Uh, my new wife would tell you that I can get lost there, um, and it's still something that I get to work on daily. You know, the, the biggest part that I get with this 12 step is it's, it's in three parts, isn't it? It talks about that I'm going to have this spiritual awakening if I do this work. It talks that I have to carry the message. <clears throat> and then it talks about that I have to live my life with the principles that I've learned. Hmm. Which one do I, do I not want to do is the one that keeps me coming back. I don't want to get up every day and have a spiritual awakening. I think I should have had that. I've worked the steps numerous times. I get to work it with sponsees. They come to my house. I love what's been said this morning. You know, I know what it's like to go to my sponsor's house. I know where we meet. I know his phone number. You know, my sponsees know the same. They know where my house is. They're always welcome in my home. My wife is part of that recovery. We get to show our sponsees what a family can be because we didn't know. I didn't know. 
until I got the opportunity to share a lifetime with this woman. Um, you know, I, I look back at, at everything I've gone through, and, and most of you have heard p- bits and pieces of my story through this conference and others. Uh, I don't, um, I never wanted to be here. I, I came in because the way I thought I heard a therapist say to me that I would hear and get what I needed if I went to an Al Anon meeting. I'm one of these purest Al Anons. You know, um, I came in kicking and screaming. And I'll probably go out kicking and screaming because I believe in this way of life. I didn't when I got here. I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like what I heard. They were talking about them, and I didn't want to hear about me. Every book I opened, every every person I talked with was a piece of my story, and it irritated the hell out of me because I'd gone to such great lengths to make sure that you had no idea what was going on behind my curtain. I don't know how many times I told my neighbors why my wife's car was on their front lawn. But that's what I did. I don't know how many times I went out looking for her with a pair of double shotguns. That's what I did. I was insane, and I didn't have to drink. But I'm addicted to you. I'm addicted to the alcoholic. I'm addicted to the chaos and and mayhem. The more drama and chaos that's in my life, I'm like a pig in the (laughs) proverbial sty. I am at home. That's my disease. You know, had I not been able to walk into these doors and, and, and find this fellowship of others that, that think like I do, I thought I was crazy. And I sit down and I hear, and I talk with them and they, and I go, Oh my God, I'm not so different. I got to hear this weekend about how the alcoholics locked up the Al Anon in a, in a, in one of the sharings earlier this weekend. Because they thought that they were crazy. Oh my hell. I was there. I remember very distinctly my wife saying to me at the time, you are crazy. Quit trying to control me. But I couldn't hear it. It was through these rooms and working the steps that I get a clue of who I am, who I can become. Because God introduces me to me. And you help me find God in these rooms and others. And then you help me see me. You get to hold a mirror up to me. I get to work with sponsees and they hold a big mirror up to me and I go, oh my God, I've still got a lot of work to do. I don't get to choose my sponsees. They choose me. God chooses them for me. You know, that's the beautiful part of this program is that I just have to be willing so we're talking about the 12th step, and I, and I see that I'm supposed to have this spiritual awakening. And I'm still waiting. I've been here for 15 years. I'm still waiting. And yet I see it every day in my life. But I think I'm supposed to have this burning bush experience. Isn't that what, I th- isn't that what the step says? I mean, I have this spiritual awakening. What does that look like? I think it should be a burning bush. Then I'd know. Then I know, but I get these little subtleties. I get these little nuances of what life and what God has in store for me, and I go, oh, maybe that's part of this. He brings a new sponsee that I get to work with. He brings a new challenge. Like today, I come down to sit down and enjoy this, and I'm asked to to get up and share on the 12th step. Hmm. I could have said no. That's not my recovery. My recovery is is that I have to be willing enough to talk about what got me here, what I've done, and what my my experience, strength, and hope. You know, we we uh, in Allen I just had a team event last year. You know what team event stood for? It stood for, you know, two outside areas joining together and having an event. We had World Service here. Um, and uh, and the theme of our program was hope. 
which I had heard at a different conference years and years ago, helping other or hearing other people's experiences. Hope. Now that made the most sense to me out of my entire recovery. Because I come and sit in a meeting, I hear somebody else share, I get to experience their experiences, and I get to experience their hope, which gives me hope that I can do this deal, that I'm willing enough to sit with another individual and say, hey, would you sponsor me? Will you work with me? Will you be there? You know, I I loved that I heard the other night about, and the truth of the matter is, is that when I got here, part of part of what I continue to work on is my feelings of abandonment. And I heard it said so well yesterday about how someone's sponsor said, I will be here no matter what. I'm yours. I'll never leave you. Man, I heard that. Had I not been here, I would not have heard that. And I would not have recognized what my sponsor has given to me. What my new wife has promised promised to me. Those are the things that I get to see in action in this program. But I can't see if I don't show up. I can't see if I don't participate. That's the real message that I've always been given in this program. I get out of it exactly what I'm willing to put into it. My sponsor said this to me years ago, and I say it to all my sponsees today. When you asked me to be your sponsor, I was guaranteed that I was going to get something. Absolutely guaranteed that I was going to get something out of that relationship. You, on the other hand, the only thing I can promise you is you're going to get to do whatever you're willing to do. You're going to get out of it whatever you're willing to put into it. But man, I didn't get that when when my sponsor said that to me. I get it today because immediately when somebody asks me to be their sponsor, I am just overwhelmed because here comes a new piece of that mirror. And it's just is like this right here in front of me. And I get to know that I'm about to walk through something that, I'm, that God has ready for me to walk through. That's part of this carrying that message that we talk about in this 12th step. It's not just about carrying it to those that are still suffering. It's about learning how do I, how do I carry it to you in this room that are still working in your, in your steps and are unwilling to maybe be of service or maybe a little bit timid about, oh, I won't do it well enough. You know what, how I learned how to grow up in these rooms? I showed up. You guys trusted me to do things that I could never see me doing. And you'd love me no matter how I, how I did it. Because all I had to do was suit up. That's how I learned how to be of service. So that this type of function, this type of, of meeting will endeavor and be here for those yet to come through. I think that's my biggest worry from Al-Anon is that what was here when I walked through won't be here when the next one's ready to walk through because we all get a little complacent. We all get a little, hmm, I'm really busy. I don't have time. Who had time for me when I walked through that door? That's the message of what this 12 step really talks to me about. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks. Thank you guys um, for being willing. So we just have a few minutes left, but um, I, this step is so huge. We should probably have more time for it. I don't know, but um, you know, I, there's no way I cannot say anything about my sponsor up here. (laughs) It's just not going to happen. So, um, you know, I just, for me, this step started with a sponsor. My sponsor saved my life. And for anybody who wants to pull me aside later and say, no human power, I'm just going to save you the time and say, my sponsor saved my life. Um, because my sponsor, um, I, I was, I was, you know how people are unemployable when they get here. I was kind of unsponsorable a little bit whenever I got here. And, um, I had a sponsor that, um, said to call and I called and then, you know, he'd either pick up the phone or he'd call me back. 
and took me through the book. And from the beginning, he told me stuff to underline. And he said, why are you underlining your book? And I would try and guess, you know, to get the right answer. I'd be like, because i got to stay sober and work the steps. And he'd say, no, it's because you're going to turn around. You're going to do this for somebody else. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, you know, no way. But, you know, from the beginning, I've, I've been, um, you know, taught about passing on this message to other people. And, um, you know, my sponsor took me through these steps. And... Um, my sponsor is not one who, um, he'll say, I'm, you know, I'm not, I mean, he's told me before, I'm not one to say what step are you working on today? My sponsor says, you know, the principles, step 12 is those principles of all the previous steps. And it's supposed to be a daily thing, you know, and that's, um, kind of how I was raised in this program. And, um, you know, I'm really grateful for that because it's, you know, I've been shown a different way to live and then it's gotten me to God. My sponsor, um, I had no God when I got here. My sponsor got me to a God by taking me through these steps. And, um, I've been listening to people up here talk about him all weekend, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, because he's, he's helped a lot of people and he's going to kill me for even saying that probably. But, um, I'm really, really grateful for this stuff. And, um, we have time for Clark. I'm just going to call on people. So there's... <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Clark. I'm an alcoholic. Hey Clark. Um, I, 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 after working the steps with uh, with my sponsor, who was, who was not the the sponsor that I'd chosen, by the way. Um, I went to one of those meetings where you raise your hand if you want a sponsor, and I'd had my eye on the guy who was running this meeting because you know he he kind of he'd show up in his bathrobe sometimes and didn't stand too close to his razor, and I I felt like you know this is probably going to be a pretty easy sponsor, and I went up to talk to him after the meeting, and I felt this iron grip clamp my shoulder, and this guy turned me around. It looked like Sergeant Rock in his civilian clothes, and um, and he said uh, you're going to call me at seven tomorrow. And I said, PM? He said, no. You call me at 7 a.m. tomorrow because that's when I'm on my way to work. And I hadn't seen that side of 7 a.m. in a long time. Um, but uh, after uh, after taking me through these steps, he he told me that uh, okay, it's it's time for you to go out and and start sharing this with somebody else. And um, I thought, okay, um, is there a class I sign up for, or is there you know? You're not just going to send me out there like this, right? Uh, but that's that's exactly that's exactly what we do. Um, God doesn't choose the qualified; He qualifies the chosen. And uh, I've most of the time that I've uh, since then, I've I've had at least uh, a couple of guys that I'm taking through the book at, at any one time, and it's it's an incredibly valuable thing. It's a very humbling thing. It's a thing too where I need to remember what the limitations are of what it is I do. My job is to relate to them as another alcoholic and to reach them uh, on that basis when other people can't. Um, I'm not a relationship counselor. I'm not an employment counselor. Uh, I'm not a, uh, a housing service. You know, uh, I'm a spiritual sounding board, I hope, and uh, my sponsees can bring me any of those problems, and I can talk to them about it on, a, on that basis. But uh, I have to remember that what the book tells me is, that, is you know, what my job is and, and what it isn't. And I hope, too, this is something my wife and I were, were talking about last night, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with this, but um, I've had sponsees that have moved away. I've had sponsees that have um, have left my sponsorship and gone on to work the steps with uh, with another guy and that's exactly what should happen if my guys you know their their spiritual experience begins with me if it ends with me they were ripped off the whole principle here is that we continue to seek you know if uh, if a guy comes to me and says yeah i want a new experience of the book oh for god's sake yeah do it I'll always be here. I'll always be here. I will always take your call. We will always have a, a spiritual relationship. But the whole principle here is that you continue to seek. And I am not the end-all, be-all of you know, if, you, if, if what you're learning here ends with what I can teach you, uh, you know, you need to, you need to reach higher. Um, uh, that's pretty much all I've got, but thanks anyway. Kristen, for thanks, thanks for it. Thanks, an alcoholic. My name is M.G. Hey. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to come up really quick. I uh, haven't seen anybody do this yet. Maybe it's because I wasn't here. But I wanted to thank the committee for all the work that they've done to make this possible. Oh, my God.
so much for it. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you were here last night, it was a huge success, huge success, and today, too. Uh, a hearty bunch, the ones that show up at the, yeah, Sunday morning, yeah. <laughs> Sunday morning spiritual speaker, you will not be disappointed. The lady that's going to come up, oh, by the way, I feel normal today, Debbie. <laughs> Been under the weather a little bit, and but I feel normal, and I just I'm, God is so good to me. Uh, and I wanted to say that's the first lady that I ever heard in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was a newcomer, and and I kept griping to my sponsor, and he and he gave me Debbie Harris's tape, Debbie Harris, and we went to South Dakota to see Debbie Harris. Uh, we flew there just to see her because. I can't hear women, you know. I mean, I can now. I mean, I'm doing better now. But, but you know, back then, and, and so he took me there. And the highlight of the whole weekend was we had to sit and have breakfast with that crazy lady. I said two words. My sponsor and her just cackled. and You know what, like when you're in a restaurant, everybody's looking at you because there's so much craziness. That's her. That's her. Unbelievable. And uh, last night, uh, Bob O., oh, he's one of the first men that I ever heard in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and what a strong message. What a good message. And his sponsor is, is one of my messengers, too. You know, he's the one that could go anywhere. You know, and, and his kind of concept was that, you know, everybody has different styles. People have been talking about different styles of sponsorship here. And that guy was okay. You know, uh, there's a guy named Frank M. And he said, you know, there's a group of people that inventories every year. And there's another group that doesn't. And he and uh, they asked him. They said, "Well, what do you think people ought to do?" And he said, "I think you ought to listen to your sponsor and do what he suggests. And you'll be just fine." So that was his answer. Anyway, I I, I love this conference. Uh, it, uh, it it wouldn't be here without uh, that Don P guy, and it's spread all over the world, all over the world, worldwide. And I think it's a good thing. And and uh, this conference, uh, when I sobered up back in July of 1990, this thing could have never, ever, ever happened, ever, ever. You know, I mean, there, there was a a real stigma attached to anybody who had gone through the book, read the book, uh, could do anything knew where the third step prayer was. It was really, really kind of weird when I sobered up in Salt Lake City. And uh, and this is just complete turnaround, and uh, I, I think it all went just how it's supposed to go. Um, I love this program. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the Fellowship of the Spirit. I'm getting out of the way. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.